uh, my question is going to be, despite the pandemic situation bringing a ne negative impact in most of the football clubs, was there any positive outcome out of this situation? The negative part is very clear, because uh, if you look at football clubs with stadiums closed, no revenues from fans, no revenues from uh, many of the boxes, etc., that we sell, uh, the negatives are very clear. Sponsorships that went down, if you look at Barcelona today and the losses that they are suffering because of the pandemic. But you can't blame everything on the pandemic. I've said previously in, uh, I think last year, I said what the pandemic did was open our eyes to the problem in the football industry of overspending, of inflation. It was already going to happen. It was a matter of time. What the pandemic did was expose all of this. The positive side of this thing is that everyone realizes that you cannot go on running football clubs like this. You cannot carry on borrowing money to spend and say, is the problem of the next person. What the pandemic has done and what is positive is exposed the entire football industry to superinflation, overspending, and very careless behavior. Uh, about the CSR, the Corporate Social Responsibility, that is a key point in the business management. Uh, what type of uh, initiatives have you done in the last years and uh, what would you like to do in the future? Valencia Club de Football is the biggest social actor in the city. And we have an honest obligation to help. We opened uh, Mestaya, the other side, to the Banco de Alimentos. There are many other initiatives we do. We have uh, uh, Escoles Blanquinegres. Antonio is here. Where's Antonio? Yeah, Antonio is doing that. He is doing it out of his heart as well. He goes to prisons to try and help reintegration of uh, people who are coming out of prison into society. Uh, we use football as a tool to tell kids in difficult situations. Sometimes their parents are not your best parents in the world. <laughs> they are in the streets. So we tell the kids, you study in school, you can play football. And many, many of them love football and they will do work, they'll work hard in school so that they can play football. The reintegration of people with difficulties in society is something we want to do. So to answer your question on CSR, I think there are many more things that the foundation is going to do, but we do it not by obligation, but because we want to. Uh, so my question, where do you see the biggest dangers for the football industry in the next years and decades? And talking especially about, for example, the Super League and also the Saudi Arabian um, ownerships, for example, of PSG and Manchester City, and also now uh, talking about Newcastle United. Uh, so where do you see the biggest dangers? Funds and foreign investors are still interested in football. They will continue buying. Be why? Because clubs need money. <laughs> clubs need money and, and uh, the money has to come from outside. What happens when foreign ownership takes place? You could have a change in the club culture or not. I think it would be a mistake to change the club's culture totally because the club is, this club is 103 years old. What you try to bring, I'm from Singapore, what you try to bring is some management style. If the old management style was working, the club wouldn't have been, would not be bankrupt, right? So logically speaking, the club needs new management style. So what we try to bring is a new management style to meet the challenges of what football is going to be like in the future. What's going to happen if we look at Super League and many other initiatives that are coming up to have a bunch of elite clubs, which are the richest clubs, trying to create their own competition. That is not going to go away. They will come back again and again and again to form their own elite group of uh, elite competition. Because for them, they say, why am I wasting my time playing with these small clubs? You know. We have the most number of fans in the world. You put these elite clubs together, there's 90% of the world in terms of fans. So logically for them, they say, it makes no sense for me to be playing with these, uh, with these smaller clubs. It doesn't bring me anything. Now, I honestly think it's a big mistake on their part because it's very short-term thinking. There's only an infinite amount of money that's going into football. So, okay, you take the 90% of the money today. Your local leagues will die. Where do you get your players from? Your players are coming from the local leagues, they're coming from the academies, etc. Now, we cannot change the world. We can participate in the debate. We can give our point of view to say that 
this is dangerous, don't go in this direction. What we have to do is prepare ourselves. If it does go in that direction, what do we do? We cannot react when it happens, we have to be prepared. For us, we decided many years ago, because it's not a new trend, it's been going on for many years, it's not just new now, that we need to build a very strong academy. A very strong academy that will not only put uh, players in our first team, we'll also put players in, in many of the other teams. Uh, today, of the 25 players we have in our first team, 12 are from our academy. And this trend, we're not going to make it 100% for sure not. But I think if 40% of our first team comes from the academy, that is a good target to keep because first of all, you're more sustainable in terms of financial management because academy you don't buy, you train and then they move up. And secondly, you're having a, some kind of identity as well. But today our academy is not just made of Valencian boys. Uh, we have a boy from Japan, uh, a boy from uh, Georgia who's now in our first team, boys from Senegal, uh, don't they must? Um, yeah, France. We have we have players from everywhere coming into academy. So it's not an an academy that's only restricted to Valencian boys. Of course, at the younger ages, for practical reasons, they may need Valencian. But the academy is how we are going to meet the future challenge of whatever happens. Because then we are in a strong state. Whatever happens, we have good players. So we are investing in the academy infrastructure, scouting, etc. Players want to come because they know they can go up. 12 of our boys are from the academy. They know that they can come up. They want to, we're getting very good players from everywhere. And that is our strategy to maintain ourselves relevant whatever happens. Uh, about the Women Football Club, uh, since the 2019 when it was played uh, the Women's World Cup, the number of women that start to play football in Europe has increased. And uh, for the next few years, this could be a new important market for all the big clubs. Would you like to invest in this market to improve the importance of Valencia women football team? This year we decided that, uh, so we had the academy girls paying money to Valencia for its brand and training in different parts, in Beniferi, in Crax, well, outside of our training ground. This year we decided to professionalize the academy, free, based on merit, and you train in our uh, sport city, where all the other boys are training. Share the same resources with all the boys, the medical resources, the gym, etc. So we have decided not only to invest, but to be serious about this, because I think that if the girls want to have a chance to be professional and have a future, want to dream of being footballers, we give them the platform. We give them the coaches, we give them the resources. If you want to do serious things about female football, start building academies, start giving them the, the, the pipeline to reach professional level and get paid properly as well. Right now, the entire infrastructure is not there. So I think, yes, we have to invest, but let's do it properly. We are starting in Valencia, first of all, by saying that you should not pay to play. <laughs> if you are good and you have a dream of playing football, you come, we'll choose you based on your merit, and we'll prepare you for professional football. You know, El Corto Plazo has uh, re-establecer uh, la situación financiera a nivel que es más sostenible, bajar los costes. Medio plazo es construir un equipo de fútbol que va a competir a un nivel top sin hacer locuras y fichar como un loco y no tener dinero para pagar luego. We started the Innovation Hub one year ago. Uh, we are one of the first clubs in Europe to have a real innovation hub uh, project. What is this innovation hub project? Uh, and we talk about startups, it's not uh, startups with 21-year-old people. These people who are, have actually worked, didn't like their work or failed, got together, came up with ideas and started a company. What we are offering to them is a platform because of our brand to come in to do projects that help the football industry and then they grow. So we're looking at the medical technology side. It's all technology based. Huh? Medical technology, digital transformation, academy technology. What's the last one? Academy, medical, digital and smart stadium. Smart stadium. And smart stadium. 
This, and in Valencia, there are many startups. There are many startups that are very happy to come in and try to help us in our technology needs. What we have done is take a participation in the company. Because come on, if you're going to use us to grow, I want something back, right? I'm going to help you to, to grow as a company. I'm going to have a stake in your company. We're the first club in Europe to, to get into this. What it helps us, it helps us without technology needs. Because in-house, we're not going to build this. It's not even outsourcing. It's actually allowing companies to use us to build their, their platforms. And then they grow. And we stay with them. Who knows, one day they grow very big, it'll be our main sponsor. But this link between startups and the club is a real one. 